The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Daily Racing Forum's Breeders' Cup 2019 webinar. I'm your host, Dan Ullman, and I thank you so much for tuning in. I have two fantastic guests to scrutinize these competitive championship races. First, he's Daily Racing Forum's ace Southern California analyst, the author of the must-read Handicapping 101, a horse racing primer, and one of the most prepared and intelligent horse players I've ever met. He's DRF's Brad Free. Next is the author of numerous influential works on handicapping, creator of the buyer's speed figures, and most horse players would consider him a true living legend and mentor, the great Andy Buyer. Gents, let's go over these Breeders' Cup races beginning with Friday's card. On the screen is a sample version of the new DRF Formulator past performances, and we'll show examples on how to use the various features during this webinar such as the customization feature. As we click on that right now, you can see that you can make these past performances your very own. You can merge workouts, you can use time form US, you can use uh, fractions by fifths or hundredths, show notes, closer looks, etc. Let's start things off, Brad, with the juvenile turf sprint. And I think it's fair to say the trainer Wesley Ward has a very strong hand in this race. Yeah, no doubt about it. He has the two morning line favorites, number nine, four-wheel drive, and um, a, another contender, number seven, Kamari. This is a five-for-long turf sprint that's on the flat oval. I, I just want to say up front, it's ex in, extremely unfortunate, in my opinion, that we don't have six and a half down the hill. Uh, and I understand San Anita's position, but it's these five-for-long races – are not always won by the best horse. I don't think that's the case. Six and a half down the hill, the best horse wins, in my opinion, most of the time. With five furlongs on turf, the last, since the middle of May, we've had 12 races with the rails at zero feet. All 12 of them have been won by a horse in the top four running positions early. And that's exactly where the morning line favorite, number nine, four-wheel drive should be positioned. He has speed. He's two for two. He's the son of first crop sire, American Pharaoh, whose progeny are doing super on grass. And I, he's drawn perfectly for his style. He can go to the lead or he can sit just off, but he will be in the hunt early. And I mean, I want to be creative on some of these races. This is not a race where I'm interested in knocking the favor. I think four wheel drive is relatively solid. There's one long shot. I'm a little bit in a couple of them actually number two band practice in from europe with the forwardly placed running style he's going to be in the hunt early and also the uh the other long shot is actually in the turf sprint so i like the favorite four-wheel drive i'm a little intrigued with band practice and i want a horse that will be forwardly placed i'm not looking for anybody coming from the back of the pack in these five furlong grass sprints well, Andy, you picked four-wheel drive second in the selector box, available, of course, in Friday's Daily Racing Forum. You're going in another direction, but not no. too far away but, in the Wesley uh, Ward barn. Yeah. For, first, may I say, I am so glad that they got rid of those ridiculous six-and-a-half furlong down the hill race. <laughs> I mean, it, the, the form was not relevant to any other race. It was dangerous for the horses. Uh, may we never see another one again. Uh, in 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 this race, I'm you know I think it is between the two Wesley Wards, uh, Kamari and Four Wheel Drive. Um, you know, I'm I'm against the Euros in here uh, <clears throat> for the following reason: when when Kamari ran it at Royal Ascot this summer. Uh, she, she narrowly beaten by a boy named Raffle Prize, who has gone on to be like a really good, you know, high level grade one runner. And so the form of that race was better, I think, than the form of any of the Euros in this field. So I think, you know, K Kamari is, uh, has really good credentials. And, you know, she, uh, she's a speed type who came out of the gate all, uh, almost last and, and was still able to win last time. So that versatility, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, gives a real plus for me. I mean, four wheel drive has got the best figure in, in truth. You know, it was a, a hard figure to make. It was, that was the only turf spread of the day. I guess it's, uh, I guess it's right, but I, I give it a little edge to uh, Kamari. 
And we're seeing Kamari finished in the DRF formulator replay functionality. And Andy was absolutely right. She had shown speed in her prior start. She's coming on the far outside, eating up ground. She did benefit perhaps from a fast pace. You'll notice that the time form U.S. color-coded fraction of the first uh, fraction was red, which means fast. But boy, she was flying as the favorite to win that race. Again, Wesley Ward is a very strong hand. Brad likes four-wheel drive. Andy likes Kamari. Uh, Talking about formulator really quickly, your notes and picks in the new PPs will show up in the betting app, not only in the PPs. And those notes and picks will also actually print in formulator. If you actually head on over to wagering and live video, you can take a peek at the live video of these races. You can watch the races. It's all in one shopping here with the new DRF formulator. Let's move on to the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. And you guys disagreed vehemently about the merits of six and a half furlong downhill turf sprints at Santa Anita. The good news is you agree on your top selection in the juvenile turf, and you believe that Aiden O'Brien's got a winner here with Arizona. Uh, we'll start with Andy. Well, <clears throat> I don't like races where Aiden O'Brien has the favorite. I mean, he he's obviously got so many good horses, and they're so, uh, you know, and you know, often they they look best on paper, but his record in the in the Breeders' Cup is really mediocre. He's like nine percent, and so you know, I I think their 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 philosophy is let's just you know let, you know at the end, it's the end of the year uh, let let's take a shot, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know I mean, a lot of his horses run badly. I'm I I can't get away from Arizona. Um, uh, I mean, he ran second to a, to a horse named Pintabu, who is like being compared to the to the mighty Frankel in in Europe. So I guess off that, he's he's a standout on paper. But I'm I'm always a little wary of Aiden. Brad, you agree with uh, Andy? You like Arizona on top? You can discuss him, but I want to talk about this Southern California runner hit the road. I think he's an intriguing long shot. Now I might be wrong, but isn't this just a lousy post position for him? When I watch this Colts races, and we can put the replay on for his most recent start, the Zuma Beach, he's just this big, imposing, mature two-year-old. He does everything right. Well, the outside post. It- could be a detriment if not for the fact that he's just going to drop out early and come with a run. So I, you know, I, I am intrigued by number 14 hit the road, his final quarter mile last time out in 23.14 seconds for a two year old in Southern California on the Santa Anita turf course was outstanding. It's true that the race kind of unraveled for him, but boy, when you watch this horse's stretch kick, this was an incredible race, and it was his first start since July. He's trained well since then, and if a California two-year-old is ever going to win a Breeders' Cup turf race, um, it, maybe it is this year, because I think hit the road has to be respected. One of the things that I use in Formulator, Dan, is looking at the final quarter miles, uh, it, it, the fractional breakdowns, and it's a terrific tool. Hit the road is one of the fastest finishers in the race with that 23.14 decorated invader 2273 that was at woodbine on yielding you know you don't want to compare course to course but you get a general idea of who the best finishers are and you also get a good idea of what the best finishers are by watching the video of hit the road so i agree with the idea that hit the road is has a chance to perhaps outrun his 10 to 1 morning line having said that when it comes to two-year-old grass routes in the Breeders' Cup, I mean, let's face it, for when, it's, when you're Colts and Geldings, Europeans typically dominate. They've won nine of the 12 runners, five, five, nine of the 12 runnings, including five of six at Santa Anita. And there's hit the road, just blowing away the field. It, there was nothing behind him, but he did it the right way. I, uh, that was hit the road. As far as Arizona goes, he's good. I mean, the horse that he chased the last two starts – Pinatubo, he's six for six, probably getting, you know, accolades that may be a little bit premature, but I think that Arizona is relatively solid, which makes me ask the question, if he's so solid, what's Aiden O'Brien doing shipping Fort Myers over here anyway off a little rinky-dink stakes win at Dundalk? Maybe this horse, number 13, Fort Myers, who's 12 to 1, is just now 
coming into his own. And he kind of reminds me a little bit of a lightly raced Colt that Aiden O'Brien came over here with in 2015 named Hit It a Bomb. He'd only started twice. He'd never raced in a graded stake race, a group stake race, and he won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. So I suspect the number 13 Fort Myers is doing very, very well. And at 12 to 1, I might be interested in taking a shot on both him and Hit the Road. But Arizona, to me, it just he just seems like the right horse on form with that group one uh, caliber placings uh, in his last two starts. So our handicappers agree with Arizona, and I want to show the folks uh, what Brad was just talking about with the incremental fractions. Again, very important in these turf races. We can go to the customization feature here in Formulator. We'll click on that. You can certainly then go to splits incremental would be uh, the way to click there. And then for horse splits, we can go leader and horse. So we would click incremental splits right there, and then we would click on this horse, and we would be able to update the, the current profile. So then you would be able to see the final quarter fractions uh, right there. Incremental splits, this horse, that'll give you the final quarter mile uh, and incremental fractions during the race. Let's move on to the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Uh, this is a really interesting race. You've got an undefeated horse from New York named Wicked Whisper. You've got Bob Baffert's Bast. Um, but we also have a fascinating first-time starter, Brad. And Simon Callahan knows where to place these maidens. He has sent out some really strong two-year-olds this year. Unfortunately, Amalfi Sunrise is sidelined. But boy, the number one Donna Velose so impressive in her career debut. She blew that field away. She blew away the field. It was a substandard field. She had a speed bias in her favor, and she was three to five in a race she was supposed to win. So she's very easy to knock. I, I, I picked her, and I almost feel guilty for picking her, but she did it the right way. She's come back to post a pair of bullet workouts since then over this deep, heavy, slow Santa Anita racetrack with a five-eighths minute flat and then a minute and three-fifths. We have some good horses training here this fall. Donna Veloce posted the best of the morning workout in two consecutive races, uh, two consecutive workouts, and I think that she might be able to overcome a significant challenge, which is to face winners, stretch out, and you know, win the Breeders' Cup in career start number two. From a wagering perspective, I, I really can't be in love with her at three to one. Wicked Whisper is very sharp. She comes out of the Frisette, the most productive Breeders' Cup juvenile fillies uh, prep race, just produced 12 winners. But having said that, I think there's this race kind of smells like it's going to be won by a, a champagne room at $69 or take charge brandy at. 125 or even a Rhea Antonia via DQ at $66. One thing that those three long shots have in common, it was all three races were at Santa Anita. I don't have a strong opinion in this race. I kind of feel like it's a cop out to take the high figure Philly making her second start of her career. But I picked Donna Veloci in horizontal wagers. I'm going to hit the all button and uh, hope we get some kind of crazy price, like maybe a KP Dreamin' at 20 to 1. But I, like, I picked Donna Veloci on, on top. And the chances for a big price would certainly increase if there was a speed duel up front. The one has to use her speed, breaking from the inside and stretching out from six and a half furlongs. Wicked Whisper has been a gate to wire winner in both of her lifetime starts. And Andy, those things could set up very well for British Idiom, who already has the winning two-turn experience that the two aforementioned horses lack. And she was very visually impressive at Keeneland last time out with the fig. That's British Idiom. Well, first of all, I mean, my main opinion in this race is that I want no part of Donna Veloce. Um, <clears throat> you know, even if this, even if she turns out to be a champion or a real, real one of the best, you know, best horses of her of her generation, going from a a, a sprint maiden race into uh, you know the most important Grade One. Uh, uh, of, of the year uh, uh, around two turns is just a huge 
uh, a huge leap. I mean, it's it's asking too much. And as Brad said, that you know she she got she was on the lead on a big rail favoring speed favoring day. I mean, that was the same day that Mongolian groom you know wired the field and the awesome again. I. I you know, I, 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 I don't want her. I mean, I, uh, uh, as you said, I mean, British idiom was, I thought, pretty visually impressive winning at Keeneland. You know, I can't knock whis- Wicked Whisper, though. She had a fairly easy trip last time. But th- those are going to be my two, uh, you know, for you know, for pick five or whatever purposes. And, uh, you know, if Donna Veloce wins, I lose. <laughs> Here's another example of the incremental pace right here on the chart that we're seeing of British Idi, and this, of course, being a dirt race. Another feature of the chart that formulator users can uh, utilize is the notes function. If you go to the far right, you can click on notes, and you can take your very own trip notes. Add a trip note, click there. You can write your trip note, and those trip notes will then automatically populate in your formulator past performances next time out. We will move to the juvenile Phillies turf. I thought, gentlemen, that this is an absolutely wide open race. Uh, Todd Pletcher has Sweet Melania. As um, Brad mentioned, these American pharaohs are really running, especially on the grass right now. Uh, you like Cristal a little bit in here, Andy. Let's talk about her. She had to come from way out of it last time. Um, she did. You know, Rhett, um uh, Brad referred earlier to uh, you know the closing fractions in in, a, in another one of these races. Uh, I, I looked up the Trackus data on that Belmont race, and now I I'm not sure I believe any f- fractions on the turf course. But her her last quarter uh, in uh, in that Belmont race. Uh, uh, if you believe the data was 22.1 seconds, that's like a world for something that world class older horses do. Um, uh, so I, I was I was impressed there. I, you know, the the the, the Euros in this race, like you know, the number five day on uh, number nine Albigna, are supposed to be pretty good. But you look at the history of this race, unlike the juvenile Colts, this has been dominated by, by U.S. horses. I mean, in fact, I mean, Chad Brown has won more runnings of this race than all of the Europeans combined. So I, uh, 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 you know, I, I, I guess I got, I have to, you have to respect Chad with the 13 selflessly, but I thought Cristal, you know, in that same, uh, uh, stakes race at Belmont ran, you know, ran the more impressive race. And I think this horse is going to be about, the Philly's going to be about 10 to one. So, uh, I, I think it's an interesting bet. And Cristal, of course, was the beaten favorite in the Miss Grio behind Selflessly. We're watching the stretch run of that race right now. Selflessly, because of the Chad Brown connection that you mentioned and his dominance of this race, uh, that filly will likely be favored over Cristal. And they were not far apart at all at the end of the Miss Grio. Now, Brad, you're looking at one of the European runners in this race, Al Bigna. And I watched her most recent start in France, and it was over very soft ground. But I just love the way she finished that race off. There was a horse that had a clear lead inside the final furlong, and she just came and got that horse. And I just don't think it was solely because of the ground. And watching her first two races at the Cura, she utilized a similar kick over firmer going. Yeah, not only did she catch the horse on the lead, but then she just she pulled away. And that was one of the big questions going into that race for Albinia. Could she could she stay a mile on soft ground? And yeah, she stayed a mile okay. She finished very, very well. It was a visually impressive race. Trainer Jessica Harrington, from what the reports that I have read, is having an outstanding season in Europe with her two-year-olds. And while I'm a little reluctant to back a European in a two-year-old grass race for Phillies, because as Andy mentioned, most of these races in the Breeders' Cup have been won by North American-based Phillies. But Albania she looks like she's just getting good right now at the right time. And I, I think that uh, she's poised on a big, another big effort. I have read reports from her trainer that this filly has gained weight even since her most recent start. So assuming that she ships well and can handle this firm going, and I don't see any reason why she would not, I look for Albina to, to run another 
big, big race. And I certainly respect the New York shippers. The, the Miss Grillo Stakes has produced five of the nine winners of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. So anything coming out of New York, you have to take a second look at. But I, I kind of like the European uh, in this spot. And I'm also intrigued by a horse that is coming in from Maryland by the name of Sharing, trained by Graham Motion. She was supposed to win last time out at odds of one to two, and I really doubt that there was much quality in that race. But this is a well-bred filly. She's out of a Breeders' Cup filly mare turf winner by the name of Shared Account. And number 11, Sharing at 12 to one, she looks like she might be she might be good enough, and I emphasize the word might because all she's done so far is beat maidens and a non-graded uh, stakes company at one to two. So she faces a, a major class hurdle. But at twelve to one, I wouldn't mind tinker, tinkering around a little bit with her. My top choice is the European, the Philly coming in from there for Jessica Herring to number nine, Albinia. And Brad questioned what Sharing beat in her last race. We can look in this chart into the next race function, and you'll see uh, where these horses stacked up. Uh, the best finish coming from Midship Lady, the fourth-place finisher, who in her very next start finished second with a 63 buyer speed figure in a turf sprint at Laurel. We'll go back to the past performances, and we will complete the Friday Breeders' Cup portion of the card with the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And I think this is... Uh, a race where we have two excellent two-year-olds. I don't know if you guys disagree with me or not. I think this two-year-old crop as of right now is exceptional. Brad, your thoughts? Well, I, I mean, there's two, there's two standouts in this race. Uh, one of them is going to be on the lead, and the other one's going to chase. They both seem to be doing well. And the, I'm going to go with the, with the speed horse, the locally-based speed horse, number six, eight rings. His win last time out of the American Pharaoh was terrific. He won by six. Dennis's moment has been kind of freaky in his last two starts with a 97 buyer in the maiden win and came right back and was a very impressive winner of the Iroquois. And he posted an outstanding workout over the San Anita surface on October 25th. And I'm glad for Rome, Dale Roman's sake that he shipped in early for that workout because I suspect that some of these New York or East Coast and Midwest shippers that are coming in late with the ability to train over this deep, heavy, slow racetrack for only a couple of days might be in for a little bit of a surprise when they go out there and try to reproduce their East Coast, Midwest form over a California surface that is an absolute bog. Um, one of those two horses is probably going to win, eight rings and Dennis's moment, but there's a long shot in here that I'm going to try to get into the exacta. I'll need one of the big names to misfire and it's number three shoplifted, who has been here all summer, all autumn long, and his race in the American Pharaoh was a lot better than it looks on paper. He was kind of sluggish early. He was wide on the first turn. He uncorked a visually impressive move into the far turn and through the far turn, and then he flattened out. This horse is a better horse than his declining figures suggest and his declining finish positions suggest. I like the fact he's been here trained over the surface all month long. I'm looking for shoplifted to somehow sneak into the exacta, but to me, the horse to beat is the horse that I expect to be on the lead, eight rings, and Dennis's moment, he might be something special. Eight rings went fast, as we saw from that time form. The U.S. Uh, pace ratings for the American Pharaoh just sort of uh, had them off the bridle at the 516th pole and kept on keeping on down to the wire, winning two turns over this track, a big advantage. And I think you make an interesting case for shoplifted Brad, because I think you could make the case that he's dirtied up. He was one of the more visually impressive debut winners at Saratoga. And then he ran well over a sloppy track that he didn't need to love when behind the now sidelined base. And, and you're right, we just saw going into the first turn, he was uh, forced very, very wide in the American Pharaoh. Andy, the fig horse, however, at least the fig horse, two starts back, the fig horse of this two-year-old crop, it's Dennis's moment. That Ellis Park maiden race, what a number. Yeah, uh, that was the best three-year-old, uh, I'm sorry, the best two-year-old figure of the year to date. Uh, it was... Uh, you know, when, when I made the, I do the Ellis figures. I mean, when I made the figure, I sort of scratched my head and say, could, could this be right? But horses have come out of that race to confirm it. And uh, Dennis's moment, you know, came back to win a, 
stakes under wraps. I think he is definitely the one to beat. I'm going to play a cold exact in here of Dennis's moment on top of Scabbard. Uh, you know, in the Iroquois, admittedly, Dennis's moment, you know, one, you know, under a hammerlock, but Scabbard really had a, uh, uh, a difficult trip in, in the in the Iroquois. I mean, he ran into traffic, uh, you know, lost his momentum. I mean, he still gets. I mean, with the trouble, he gets a figure of eighty-seven, which is what eight rings had with a relatively easy trip. I mean, the speed that was a somewhat speed favoring day. The speed went one two around the track. Uh, the uh you know the figure is 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 just okay i mean it, 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 because it's baffert he'll he'll be bet off the board so i i'm gonna i mean listen eight rings is the speed of the race he can win but i i'm gonna uh i'm, I'm gonna try to beat him uh with, with a one five exact well that's the same exactly that came in the iroquois dennis's moment winning that race in his two-turn debut and rating successfully off the pace he might be the horse to beat eight rings might be the horse to catch they are two two-year-olds of immense quality and it's going to be a fun breeders cup juvenile uh taking a look at another one of the customization uh factors that we have here with formulator we can click on customize it's the merge workouts function and uh, if you click on that you can then uh click on traditional and all of a sudden, we'll go back to uh, after we update the current profile. Uh, we can go and see what Brad was talking about. Dale Roman sent Dennis's moment out to Santa Anita early, and he mentioned it might be very valuable, and it seems like he really likes it. That October the 25th workout, the fourth workout since the Iroquois, uh, the best of 51, a bullet half mile in 46 and 3. We'll move to the Saturday Breeders' Cup program. Uh, we'll start with the Philly and Mare Sprint, and there's a brilliantly fast horse in here, Andy, named Kafefi. A lot of folks are raving about about her two 107 buyer speed figures and somehow lost in the shuffle is that come dancing has actually run a faster race this year. Um, it, it's a two horse race between those two. I, I think I, um, I mean, I give it a little edge to come dancing because I think that, you know, with, with, with you know, with the, the speed in this race, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, the, it may develop in a way that can favor a horse who uh, who can sit and stalk and, uh, just just off the lead as Come Dancing did last time. I mean, Kafifi is you know has you know you know thrown in you know two monster races, but I mean her others you know have been you know just you know just okay. Uh, you know I. I you know, I, I think Come Dancing's uh, overall form is, uh, is is really excellent. So that that's my preference. But you know, for pick four, whatever uh, purposes, I mean, it, you know, there there are only two horses you need to use here. Well, Brad Kafefi draws down inside, and if she's going to win this year's edition of the Philly and Mare Sprint, you're going to have to earn it probably from flag fall to finish because there are some very fast horses in this race, especially Selcourt, who was the pace setter in last year's Philly and Mare Sprint off of a long layoff and now has a prep. That might set things up for a closer. And if you want to talk about a horse that made a very nice visual impression last time out, that's your top pick and potential upsetter. That's the number nine, Spice Perfection, who's based in Southern California for Peter Miller and kind of really had no business winning the TCA after the start of that race. We'll watch the video and show the start. Yeah, she had every right to lose this race. It was her it was her comeback race, her first start since early May, and Spice Perfection breaking from post number three. This is a filly who typically is forwardly placed, presses the pace, but she does not come out very well. She stumbled badly at the break, and right here you're going, well, that's it for her. Maybe she'll just sit back and somehow make a run. Uh, just hit the board perhaps in, in a, a good prep. Well, she did more than just hit the board. She actually won the TCA by a head after that bad stumble, weaving through traffic and all that. So I, I loved her comeback race. I like where she's drawn. And I have questions regarding both Kafefe and Come Dancing. Kafefe is a three-year-old filly, and three-year-olds have historically underachieved in the Breeders' Cup Philly Mare Turf, specifically test winners, there have been eight test winners that have tried the Breeders' Cup Philly Mare Sprint. None of them have won. 
four of them have lost as the favorite, and only one of them so much as hit the board. So Kofefi shipping in with a historical challenge, and it's, as for Come Dancing, yeah, she's pretty good in five horse fields in New York uh, with perfect trips. So when she's been odds on in her last four starts, she's supposed to compile a good record. I'll take the the battle tested veteran Spice Perfection, who's a pro at seven eight. She's won over the Santa Anita racetrack, and if she can run two alike, and if she doesn't bobble at the break, I think that she's good enough to overcome her speed figure dis, uh, disadvantage and beat both Kafefi and Come Dancing. Sorry, Thank the speed fig Brad, the speed figures are just too weak. I mean her her lifetime best of a ninety three uh you know is uh is inferior to every, every race come dancing as has you know, has run since last December. I, I can't see it. Well, I mean that, that you're right as far as that, but those all those numbers were earned on a completely different circuit. And I suspect that both Come Dancing and Kafefe, I think they're going to face a challenge reproducing their best form in California on Saturday. I think we both would agree, all three of us would agree. We, we, don't agree, we may not agree on uh, the merits of Spice Perfection, but we might agree that turnbacks at seven furlongs are a very valuable handicapping angle. And Brad and Andy, I'm interested in your thoughts on Bella Fina, who was really sort of the bee's knees of this division early in the season, and she sort of went off form. I was really impressed with her win in the Santa Inez going seven furlongs. I always kind of liked her going shorter. Do you think she has an upset chance turning back to this distance? Yeah, I, she has an yeah, upset chance, but, I, I, I mean, her last three starts, are, it's very difficult to support a Philly like her who finished fifth, third, and fourth. And I know that the pace was fast in the cotillion and she really doesn't want to go two turns. Um, she was off slow in the test. She just kind of ran around the track. I don't know if she's the same filly that we thought she might be last year as a two-year-old. She's four for four at Santa Anita. She has run races that put her relatively close. She's the only entrant that's going route to sprint in this field. So yeah, she has an upset chance. Do I like her? Not really. I mean, she had a br a brutal trip at Parks. So you've got to give her that. I mean, she, <clears throat> I mean that was a gigantic pace. Uh, you know, the, the field was it was full of speed. She's parked four wide on the first turn. Uh, you know, to, you know, chases the leader, makes the lead, and and fades, and now turns back. I mean, she's. Uh, uh, I mean, she's she's. I, I think we'll we'll get a piece of it somewhere. Remember, folks, that you can also get um, news uh, above the past performances in the formulator. Again, it's truly one-stop shopping. You get your wagering, your live video, and when you click on news and analysis, you get the latest stories and race advances for the major races. You get the analysis from Brad, and you get the selections from the selector box and daily racing form for each of these races. So news and analysis also available here in formulator. We'll move on to the Breeders' Cup turf sprint you guys are in agreement in this race and i can certainly understand why uh eddie haskell last time out broke from the inside post was the favorite in the eddie d the local prep for this race and i think a lot of folks were very surprised when joel rosario took this horse back off of the pace considering his good tactical speed this horse was flying late you could argue he was best i know peewee reese is a good horse but he also shot right up the rail and he saved a lot more ground uh than Eddie Haskell. We'll start with you, Andy. Um, yeah, I, I liked Eddie Haskell too. Uh, uh, the, the 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 first two days at Santa Anita, when the turf course was in pristine shape, horses on the rail were winning everything, and the uh, you know and the the fact that Eddie Haskell uh, you know came four wide in the stretch and was was motoring down the the middle of the track. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that was something that not many horses, uh, did, uh, I mean, this is a really tough race, but, you know, just off of that trip, I, I, I have to have to take a shot with Eddie, but the, this race is, is really tough because there are a lot of horses with, who have run, you know, really big races on a go back. And if horses like Leinster, or, uh, 
uh, stormy liberal or uh, uh, pure sensation to kind of go, you know, re- refine their best form, they can all win. Fred, your I totally agree. Yeah. yeah, I agree with what Andy said. I mean, Eddie Haskell, he was best in the in the Eddie D last time out. And the, the strategy that was employed by Rosario, I don't think that was by choice. It just happened. He got shuffled back early and lost position, breaking from an inside draw. And he really had no choice but to kind of take back and then come around with the run. Meanwhile, the winner, Pee Wee Reese, saved every inch of ground. And he, Pee Wee Reese is a very good horse. And he kicked away in a very strong comeback. Uh, he unfortunately was subsequently hurt, and that's why he's not in this race. But Eddie Haskell, beaten a half length, he was best on the day. He's a pro at five furlongs. And I think with a little bit better trip, I think he can win. But there are several others in this field that are very – this is an evenly matched bunch. Uh, pure sensation is tough coming in from New York. I'm a little intrigued with Ohm on the outside. But when all is said and done, it's Eddie Haskell for me. And just to reiterate what I said earlier, I can't wait until we start running six and a half down the hill once again. That that might actually help Ohm, who I believe placed in the Breeders' Cup uh, turf sprint well, going down the hill a few years back. He sh- definitely should have won that race. And Pure Sensation, I think, is very happy that this race is not down the hill. I believe he was third in that 2017 edition of the uh, turf sprint. He likes five. Unfortunately, this isn't Pennsylvania. That's where he seems to do his best running. But we'll know him on the early lead. Ohm, a very intriguing runner as well in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint. Brent. We'll move on to the dirt mile. And before we get started to the dirt mile, Andy, I have to ask you one question. Is spun to run for real? Is that last buyer speed figure something that we should look at cockeyed or should we just take the 110 buyer as gospel? Um, a little of each. The 110 is uh is absolutely correct i mean other horse, horses have come out of that race and you know and run back to their figures uh you know it's 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 parks <laughs> i mean the fact that three of the four best three-year-old figures of 2019 have all been recorded at parks in recent weeks makes you wonder if there's something in the water down there i don't know i i i have to i guess i have to use this horse i'm not i don't want to be uh want to be beaten by a top figure and this is the kind of improbable looking figure that you know can uh you know can one of the few situations where you can you know, get a big price on the standout number, but I'm let's say I'm I'm a little wary uh, of the, of the horse. I think it's apropos that you use the term improbable figure because yeah. Spun to Run finished behind improbable in the Pennsylvania Derby, the race preceding his big number. And Brad, improbable, of course, trained by Bob Baffert, the beaten favorite in both the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. He just didn't get out of the gate in the Pennsylvania Derby, and he was kind of locked down inside, and I'm not really sure he wanted to go through that hole. So while a lot of folks are down on the Pennsylvania Derby because the race was won by, on paper, a hopeless long shot, I I think Improbable had some excuses. Yeah, he absolutely had excuses. The slow start buried on a on a dead rail, and and he you know was unable to overcome those challenges. He's back home right now. He's training terrific, and I think that you know even though Omaha Beach is probably a better horse than Improbable, when Omaha Beach defeated Improbable this spring at Oakland, the margin was relatively minimal, uh, improbable finish second by a length in the Arkansas Derby, but Omaha beach just toyed with improbable in that race. Omaha beach subsequently went to the sidelines, had a, a outstanding comeback in the sprint, but improbable has at least two routes under his belt. Whereas Omaha beach is stretching out off a single sprint race. And I don't like it when connections are basically saying that they're, we're going to lower our expectations because Omaha Beach should be in the Breeders' Cup Sprint, a tougher, better field with a lot more prestige than a Grade One Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile that nobody really cares about. So I'm I part of me is just from a sporting perspective, I, I don't really like Omaha Beach dropping in class uh, to to take the easy spot, quote easy spot. But this is the the spot in which improbable 
fits best. He's a miler through and through, and if he breaks, I think he'll give Omaha Beach all that he can handle, and he's my top selection, improbable, in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Both of you like improbable, and do you have him on top as well? Yeah, I, I think Omaha Beach is going to be the most overbet horse of of the weekend. Um, you know, because he had, you know, he had the, you know, the big reputation as the, uh, you know, the early Kentucky Derby favorite, and what happened to be like one of the worst generations of Kentucky Derby horses I've ever seen. Uh, you know, so his, you know, his reputation as a leader of the three-year-olds doesn't sway me, and his life, his lifetime best figure is a one o three, which is, uh, which. which uh, uh, is probably not going to win this race. I mean, I, uh, uh, you know, I th- think when you look at improbable, it's pretty clear, as Brad said, he, his his game is a, is one mile. That you know, in in all of the three year old uh, big three year old stakes races this year, he never passed a horse in the stretch going between a mile and a sixteenth and you know and a mile and a quarter. But you know, he got that figure of a hundred four at a mile at Del Mar. His previous uh, one mile race was a two year old. He won by seven at Churchill Downs. Uh, I think that uh, uh, that you know that this is the race that's going to suit him. Uh, a horse that both of you used in your top four selections in the selector box in Fridays, in Saturday's DRF, pardon me, is Diamond Oops. And this is a horse that seems to be coming into form for Pat Bien Cohen. Uh, Brad, the last time he raced on dirt, he split arguably the two best sprinters in the country, Imperial Hint and Matoli, and he certainly ran uh, a crackerjack race last time out in the Shadwell Turf Mile. The pace doesn't look overly fast, but that race kind of fell apart a bit late, and he was the only part of the pace still around at the end. Well, we know that Tom Diamond Oops can run fast on dirt with the 105 in the Vanderbilt, and we know he can run long because he did it last time out in the Shadwell Turf Mile. Now he's going to put those two together, and he's kind of the, he's the one horse that interests me at a price. Um, the morning line maker has him at 15 to one. I made him 10 to one. He is, he definitely has a, a, a look at a potential upset. Uh, Andy, what are your thoughts on diamond Oops? He certainly got that. I, I, on I, dirt I, last uh, time out. I, I uh, echo Brad's sentiments there. I mean, the, the dirt figure followed by the, you know, the, the good mile race on turf, uh, you know, could add up to an upset. I mean, there's nobody here with overwhelming credentials. A horse with overwhelming credentials will be the heavy favorite in our next Breeders' Cup race, the Philly and Mare Turf. She is one of the superstars of the racing game here in North America, Brad. It's the defending champion, Sister Charlie. She loses her pace setter, Thais, uh, scratched earlier this morning. Sister Charlie doesn't need a lot of help, however. Her form basically speaks for itself. She doesn't need any help at all. She's, to me, you know, one of the more probable uh winning favorites on Breeders' Cup Saturday. I'm not really that interested in betting against her. All she does is win races, six consecutive grade ones. Uh, to me, it, it, you know, she's. It'll, I'll be shocked if she doesn't run very, very well. The European to her inside, number one, Iridessa, can. she's a two-time Group 1 winner. She can get a mile and one quarter. She's the one horse that I might be tinkering around a little bit, but I like Sister Charlie. And Andy, you're going a different direction here with one of the I European. Don't, I don't like Sister Charlie. I mean, despite that glittering record, <clears throat> she's coming off just about the worst race of her life. Uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, that, the field that she beat was uh, uh, where she was one to five. Uh, <clears throat> she really had to work hard to win that. I mean, there were no excuses instead of draw, you know, exploding away from the field. She, uh, you know, she, you know, she ground out a three quarter of a length win. I mean, horses, uh, I mean, they, horses can all go off form. And, uh, I, I just don't want to take, uh, you know, a, a super short, short price on a horse. I, th- I think is coming off a poor, uh, a relatively poor effort. So, I mean, this is just a guess for me. I mean, I, uh, you know, I would definitely use the two, two of the Euros, uh, number three fleeting and number nine Villa Marina. But I, I, uh, I just think in, in, 
you know, in terms of, uh, you know, exotic bets, uh, taking a, at least taking a chance to beat uh, Sister Charlie is is reasonable. This is not a single. Certainly an interesting contrarian opinion there, going with the two Europeans, both who ran very well in France in the Prix de l'Opera. We will move on to the Breeders' Cup Sprint. It's the rematch between Imperial Hint and Matoli. They faced off at Saratoga. Imperial Hint got the better of Matoli. Uh, Andy, some might say that Matoli was co- sort of stuck down on a deep and tiring rail that day. Sometimes you say, however, and I think it's an interesting point, that these sort of dead rails are self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, they, they, they can be, and I think there is, uh, there is, you know, become kind of a, uh, you know, there's some s- s- certain amount of mass hysteria about bad rails that I see around the country. Brad, Brad Brad referred to the dead rail in the Pennsylvania Derby. Well, I went back and 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 you know looked looked at uh, all the, the the charts for that day. Plenty of horses won on the inside, and uh, uh, as you say, when the jockey you know when the jockeys get it in their mind, or they hear TV analysts like Andy Serling you know say, "Oh, the rail is dead today." I mean, nobody wants to be second guessed for being there. So even horses who are toward the inside, like they swing out to the three path. So I, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't buy that dead rail argument on, uh, on Matoli. I mean, Andy and I had, you know, some disagreements <laughs> of, uh, about that, but anyway, I mean, she is a terrific filly and, uh, you know, her, her win in the Met mile, uh, you know, or, or I'm sorry, he is a terrific colt, <laughs> but uh, and and his win in the Met Mile was uh, you know really you know cemented his quality. But I think with you know with with all the the, the front running speed in this race, and, and notably Chance a lot, the fastest horse in the world, uh, this is gonna uh, this race may you know favor somebody who can. Who, who can finish and and i i think imperial hint uh uh maybe that horse uh brad your thoughts on matoli i mean his merits are are very obvious on paper the one bad race again some might argue down on the deep and tiring rail well his most recent performance he was back to his best he's one of the better horses in the country on his very best days and i think you're kind of against imperial hint a little bit in here well, I'm I'm only against him in principle, not not on his form because he's an outstanding racehorse. But as I mentioned earlier, I, I am going to go into the weekend, and I might be proven completely wrong that some of these shippers from the East Coast and Midwest might be uh, racing over a Santa Anita racing surface that they are unaccustomed to. This surface is deep, slow, tiring, and a lot of horses struggle with it. So I don't want to take a short price on a horse at Santa Anita based on New York or Kentucky form. Matoli has been here all, all, uh, all month long. And whatever the reason was for his, you know, misfire in the Vanderbilt, I don't care if it was a dead rail or if he just didn't fire because he didn't feel like it that day. It doesn't matter. He ran below par. He returned to run his typical race, a 105 buyer in the forego. He's trained extremely well over the Santa Anita surface, and I think he's the horse to beat. He's the morning line favorite, so it's not a real creative opinion, but uh, I do know that he likes this surface. I don't know that that's the case with Imperial Hint. What do, what do, we, what do, what do we do with Shantz a lot? I think you've got to give him another chance. I really do. He's fast, and I, I, I expect him to go pedal to the metal and, and try to wire this field. He's done well since that race last time out. Um, I, I think that he's got a big look, Andy. He's my second selection in here. He's very quick. I don't know if he's as good as the Amsterdam uh, you know, yeah. made him appear to be, but I think he's right in there with, with the rest of them. I mean that was just one of the most monst- monstrous performances I've seen in a long time. I mean that was, uh, from the speed figure standpoint, the fastest sprint in the U.S. in ten years. I mean, and you know you could say, well, maybe it was a once in a lifetime thing, but 
you know he's he's got the potential to do it. I mean, I you know I since I love to see horses run big figures, I'd like like you know I'd like to see him maybe do it again sometime. But uh, you know his last two races uh, since since that big figure, you know, to me a little disappointing. Yeah, I want to just Red. remind remind uh, the listeners uh, of a little a story, just a real quick one. It was 2003, and it, the Breeders' Cup was at Santa Anita, and there was a three-year-old coming into Santa Anita off a 113 buyer speed figure at Turfway Park. And the guy that I happened to be sitting next to in the press box absolutely loved Cajun Beat at 22 to 1. Andy, do you happen to recall that race? I do indeed. I believed my figure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and she yeah, made a pretty good score. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Brad, you mentioned earlier when discussing Omaha Beach that you really weren't that happy that he's kind of taking the path of least resistance running in the dirt mile. The, the, the exact opposite is true here for Catalina Cruiser, who originally it looked like was being pointed to the dirt mile, and instead they're taking a shot, turning him back in the much tougher race, the sprint. Uh, and of course, he is based in Southern California. Your thoughts on Catalina Cruiser, whose one and only loss, unfortunately, came on the biggest stage last year's Breeders' Cup? Well, I mean, you talk about a, a, a huge horse. He's he's a beast. He's like almost 1,300 pounds. He's won seven out of eight, and this race could actually set up perfectly for him. I know he's down on the inside. Big deal. Matoli's going to go. Chancelot's going to go. There's speed to his outside. He conceivably could get the same type trip that he got in the true north. Now, that was a grade two, and you know he beat strike power and recruiting ready. Big deal. But Catalina Cruiser has the right running style or a versatile running style that could conceivably put him in a good spot. If the speed backs up, Catalina Cruiser will be one of the first to attack. And I think it's a sporting move on their part, taking a shot for two million bucks as opposed to the dirt mile, which I really nobody really cares about. Andy, your thoughts on Catalina Cruiser? A little bit too tough of a spot. Are you worried that the distance is a little short for him? I, I I just I mean this is a, an extremely tough field and and uh, I just don't see uh, him uh, you know having uh, you know the level of form uh, this year to uh, you know to beat these these tough horses. We'll move on to the late pick four on Breeders' Cup Saturday. Uh, two uh, extremely strong fillies. Uh, will take uh, perhaps center stage in the mile. That's got Stormy, who just excelled at Saratoga over the summer, beating the boys in the four-star Dave. And Uni, who came from way out of it with a sparkling late run to win the first lady stakes last time out. But both of you like a European runner in here named Circus Maximus. And unlike a lot of Europeans, this horse seemingly has a little bit of tactical speed, Andy. I mean, I I looked. There, this race is so devoid of speed that uh, you know I looked at it principally to see who's going to be on or, or on or near the lead. And I mean, Circus Maximus is is capable of going to the front. I mean, once once again, this is my nemesis Aiden O'Brien. So I don't know what to do with the horse, but I I I really don't want. You know, uh, uh, horses with a with a style like Uni in here. Uh, you know, in a you know in a big field with no speed. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know another horse that uh, you know that you know so, you know has the capability to to lie close is the thirteen Hay Gammon. I mean, if you draw a line between uh, over those. Uh, two soft turf races, you know, he's got, uh, I mean, he's got good dope and he was like, you know, chasing the pace in seven furlong races, uh, Frankie de uh, you know, I, I, I think he's got an excellent shot in here too. Brad, you agree with Circus Maximus. Again, that tactical speed should play very well, and it should play well for Got Stormy, who, who obviously has way more tactical speed than the one-run closer, Uni, who's mired in a tough outside post position. But Circus Maximus has a lot of class. Yeah, he not only has class, he has speed. Uh, group one form overseas, he'll be either on or near the lead. And, you know, this race, as Andy said, there's really no 
legitimate pace setter in the field. So I want somebody forward replaced. Circus Maximus and God Story both have enough tactical speed to be within the close to the front. And I think those two could conceivably make it a parade because not only do they have speed, but they also can finish. And that is a tough combination to beat at a mile on grass. So a consensus here with Circus Maximus, Andy picked Got Stormy third, Brad picked Got Stormy second, and keep an eye out for Hay Gammon at a big price, a European invader that Andy picks second. We move on to the Breeders' Cup distaff in Midnight B Zoo going for a perfect season. She has been the dominant filly in the division all season long, and she's just been pretty remarkable. I mean, the personal ensign, I think there were a lot of folks that were concerned about her at a mile and an eighth against the distance loving a late. Well, she ran down a late in the shadow of the wire, and I thought she got a nice stiff prep last time out in the Bell Dame when Wow Cat came to her. Andy, a lot of folks are going to believe that she's the most likely winner, or one of them at the very least, of the entire two-day Breeders' Cup extravaganza. Yeah, I've been skeptical of a number of favorites on this card, but uh, she... uh... Uh, she looks like the goods to me. I mean, she never runs a bad race. She's, you know, beaten all the fillies around and, uh, you know, got a, you know, so, you know, solid the edge on the, on the figures. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to get clever here. Uh, Brad, I'm going to try to get clever. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dan. I, I'm going to try to get clever here. And I have nothing but respect for Midnight DC. Seven for seven this year. Um, you know, she's, tactical she's versatile she can do it all she's won at five different tracks this year i mean she's rock solid she's also six to five or seven to five in the betting in what i i think this field is a lot more evenly matched than a lopsided favorite midnight bisu deserves to be the favorite but there's a couple other horses in this race one in particular that i know when she fires she is good enough to win a race like this and that's number one paradise woods I don't like the fact that she's down inside because she's a temperamental filly that can sometimes have some issues going to the gate and in the gate. And there's also a couple of speed horses to her outside, Serengeti Empress and Mosi Cal. But if Paradise Woods can somehow work out a trip and get to the outside of those two aforementioned pace setters into the first turn, I think she's going to reproduce, if not improve, on her most recent start in the Zenyatta. She will have first run over Midnight Bisu, and then it's going to be a horse race to the wire. But I'm going to take a little bit of a shot. It's kind of a wise guy showboat selection. But I like Paradise Woods. I've been a fan of her since she won the Santa Anita Oaks in the third start of her career uh, two years ago. So uh, I'm going to take Paradise Woods in an upset over a very, very good filly, Midnight Bisu. We'll move on to the Breeders' Cup turf, and there's going to be a heavy favorite in here. And it's really a fantastic Breeders' Cup because there are so many Horse of the Year implications here. If Midnight Bisou puts on a show and one or two things happen, she could be Horse of the Year. Perhaps the same could be said for Matoli. If McKinsey wins the Classic, perhaps he's Horse of the Year. I think if Bricks and Mortar wins the turf, uh, he is a very logical candidate, despite being merely a turf horse. Uh, he has been no mere turf horse all season long for Chad. Brown, who were t- the sources were turned off a lengthy layoff with just big performance after big performance. And the question, Brad, coming into this race is, is he a tweener? Is a mile too short for him? Is a mile and a half too long for him? Chad Brown was sort of waffling for a while and waiting to decide until basically the last minute before going for the mile and a half. He's the best horse, I believe, in this race. And Anthony Van Dyke is no slouch. But are you worried about the mile and a half distance? I would be if there hadn't already been precedent for horses that have never raced at a mile and a half uh, to win this race before, but it's been won three times. Magician in uh, 2013, Joe Har and Kalanisi in 2000. All three of those Breeders' Cup turf winners were racing a mile and a half for the first time. Bricks and mortar. Chad Brown knows what he's doing. He knows what he has to work with, and what he has to work with in bricks and mortar is a horse that's won 10 out of 12, and is a multiple grade one winner. So I'm not that concerned about the distance. In fact, I'm not concerned with it at all. My only concern is what price he's going to be. And as for this year's Breeders' Cup, you know, I would argue that maybe this isn't the greatest Breeders' Cup because when you look through some of these races and you look at horses like Midnight Bisou and Sister Charlie and Omaha Beach and, and, uh, and, and that and Bricks and Mortar, 
you're talking about four horses that are extremely short prices because of their apparent superiority. And, you know, they deserve to be favorites. But in some of these high caliber Breeders' Cup races this year, it's a little surprising to me to see that there is such a, quote, standout. Uh, Bricks and Mortar is a standout to me in the Breeders' Cup turf. The only long shot that I'd give a look to, he's completely outclassed. That's Acclimate, who I expect to set the pace. And he sometimes can get brave on the front end, but Bricks and Mortar looks pretty solid. Andy, I know you concur with Bricks and Mortar. You yeah, also I mean, picked Anthony Van Dyke second. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was uh, a little, I was wary of him because for the reason yeah. that Brad cited that you know, you know, Chad Brown was, seemed to be waffling about you know, you know, the, the the distance factor, but even taking that into account, it's just hard to make a case, a case for anybody else. I mean, Anthony Van Dyke, I, you know, is okay, but there's no, you know, no killer euros in here and the U S horses don't look like that much. So I, I guess it's br- bricks and mortars by, uh, by possibly by default, but I, I, I don't like this race as a betting proposition. And we conclude this year's Breeders' Cup with the main event, the Breeders' Cup Classic. And there are so many questions coming out of the recent prep races. I mean, McKinsey beaten at a short price last time out, sort of got a curious ride that day. Higher Power, the winner of the Pacific Classic, had a legitimate excuse in the awesome again. He stumbled at the start. How good are the three-year-olds, uh, led perhaps by Code of Honor? Uh, we, Andy has already mentioned that he doesn't think much of this crop. Elate underperformed. Maybe she bounced in the spinster last time out but i do think we'll agree on one thing and i think that if mckinsey runs his race he's simply the best horse but i have the same question for andy that i had for brad regarding bricks and mortar are you concerned about mckinsey at a mile and a quarter yes yes uh, you know he got beat by gift box uh, the last time he went a mile and a quarter uh um uh, so i mean the distance uh you know is definitely an issue and you know i you know the horse I mean, he's very consistent. I mean, he he runs, uh, you know, uh, you know, pretty pretty solid numbers uh, every time. But they're, you know, they're not, you know, they're not numbers that uh, 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 you know that guarantee him a win. I mean, uh, you know, you have horses like Yoshida who, who you know run big you know, big races. I mean, high, higher powers next to last was a 107. So, I mean, I. Um, you know, I'm not in love with McKinsey, but I just, uh, you know, we're particularly with the questions about the distance, but I just couldn't make a persuasive case for anybody else. Uh, I'm right with Andy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't, if he doesn't win, I don't know who does. It looks like just yeah. a kind of relatively evenly matched bunch. I think the tactics on McKenzie are going to be a little different on Saturday. I think Rosario is going to be intent on making the lead. And if he makes the lead and if he gets a mile and one quarter, I think that he can win this race. If he can't stay the trip, then it's anybody's race. Yoshida is my second selection coming from out of the clouds. But this race is a puzzler. I know it's the you know richest race of the weekend. You're supposed to have an opinion. I really don't. Uh, to me, like Andy is bricks and mortar by default in the turf. For me, in the classic, it's McKenzie by default in the in the in the classic. Yeah, you know, the the one mm-hmm. horse that I tr- I tried to make a little case for here was higher power. I mean that, mm. that win in the Pacific Classic that was a legitimate figure. He won by five, you know, and uh, uh, the hundred seven, you know, will p- put him right there. And then, uh, you know, you know, last time he he stumbled coming out of the gate. He just never got, you know, never got into it on, uh, you know, when. Uh, on a day when the rail was was good and speed was good and Mongolian uh, groom wired the field. So, I mean, higher power, you know, is conceivable, I guess. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, that, that's about as much uh, enthusiasm as I can muster for him. 
So a consensus on McKinsey, however, a tepid one at that. I want to thank Brad and Andy for taking the time uh, out of their extremely busy schedules, especially this week, uh, to take part in this webinar. I want to thank all of you for joining us. And remember, you can catch on demand uh, this uh, webinar at uh, the Daily Racing Forum YouTube channel and at video.drf.com. Best of luck in the Breeders' Cup, everybody.